we're trying to do this year is use the online platform to capture things that can't be captured in a print journal. Sure. So sure. music, uh, poetry readings. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to revamp that space. All right. So we're in your poetry room. Look at that. And you're about to read some poems. Can I ask what's the first poem that you've decided sure. to read for um, us? The first poem is entitled Red Rover. Do any of you remember playing that game when you were kids? <laughs> yeah. The Red Rover, Red Rover, send so on. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, it came about because my, my family, my wife and, and two daughters and I, were driving up to Yosemite. And we went the back, back road, uh, Highway 14, and came in through Saddleback Lake and all that up there on our way to Tuolumne Meadows. And as we were driving, I saw an off-ramp street that said Red Rover. And this poem just started to sort of, it doesn't, I don't usually work that way at all. Mm -hmm. Usually, I, you know, it takes a long time to get a poem to where I think it's half decent. Um, but this one just sort of started falling out of me. It's pretty simple. Um, so I had to pull into a gas station and <laughs> write, write it down on a piece oh, wow. of scrap paper that I found in the, toy, uh, in the, uh, the waste basket. <laughs> so anyway, this is Red Rover. Red Rover, Red Rover, send Emily over, send Emily over and over again. And over and over, Red Rover, Red Rover, and over and over and over again. And as she grows older, Red Rover, Red Rover, she still, still she comes over and over again. And over and over, Red Rover, Red Rover, and over and over and over again. But then comes a day when is becomes was, and was then has been, O oh, Rover, Red Rover. And over and over is over, is over. It's over, Red Rover. It's over again. Wow. So, Very you know, nicely done. Passage of time kind of thing. And uh, um, I, I, I tend to be a little bit obsessed with uh, the passage of time. In fact, I, I had a secret. I, I don't type very well. I don't have a computer. I'm just a complete techno mm -hmm. um, idiot, phobe, Neanderthal, <laughs> whatever. And so I would bring my handwritten poems into my secretary, and she typed them up. And she typed one up and brought it to me, and she said, um, it's quite lovely, Paul, but she's British. She said, but don't you think you could write about something other than the passage of time? <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll work on that. So, so um, this next one, so that's an early poem. This next one's kind of middle period. and. Uh, this is what they call a prose poem. Have you guys looked at that before? So, so it's this one here, and it looks like a paragraph. But the idea is that it um, that it has imagery and that it that it. Um, how to define a prose poem? Anybody? It has some of the elements of poetry in like a paragraph. Very good. Setting. Yeah, it tries to incorporate some of the elements of poetry into a, a paragraph form. So this one is entitled 1937, which coincidentally happens to be the year that I was born. Oh, wow. So if you want to do some quick math, you'll see that I'm what they call an octogenarian. <laughs> I'm in my 80s. <laughs> so anyway, this is a poem, 1937, which was a pretty significant year in the world as was 38, 39, and World War II, and so on. And um, I, it, it came about because I wandered into an antique store and saw, you know, those kind of calendars where they have a, a girl with her kicking her legs up mm -hmm. in the air and then a little, then the, the dates of, of that month. So, so that's what happened here, and that's what kicked the poem off. 1937. <clears throat> a random foray a stray antique store, wall pinup calendar displaying brown, long hair, red whip, <coughs> excuse me, red lips, wide open, white teeth. But what caught my eye, the date, 1937, my birth year. And lo, at the bottom, my month, September. Oh, the days dwindled down indeed. While my mother was giving me life on this day, the ninth, a Japanese air raid 
killed 300 Chinese refugees four days before my mother's father died. Four days after, Thomas Masaryk too. And two weeks beyond him, Bessie Smith. FDR began the, the year saying, I see one-third of a nation ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished. Mao and Chang began separation woes. The agonies of war came to us in April, not from Cafe News, but a painting etching in our collective consciousness the evisceration of souls in Guernica. Exiled in Mexico, Trotsky implored for the overthrow of Stalin. Random headlines outline more of the times. Hindenburg blows up. Dow Chemicals begin, begins manufacturing plastic. Hollywood favorite Gene Harlow dies. Somoza becomes president of Nicaragua. Lewis defeats Braddock. Earhart lost at sea. Disney produces Snow White. Buchenwald established Fourth Camp. And if you watch the Lewis Braddock reels, in the corner of the screen, as Lewis's arm is being raised, you will see a ghostly figure slip into view, turn over Braddock, and photograph his dazed face. The figure is my father, the photo lost in a family move. So 1937 ended with these. Maurice Ravel dies, Jane Fonda is born, Java Man linked with Homo sapiens, Java Man, it seems, may have been the victim of brain-feasting headhunters. And Japanese and Japan begins atrocities in Nanking as my lovely mother held me in her arms. Wow. wow. So, <laughs> you know, that's kind of a heavy one with a fair amount of history dropped into it. Um, and uh, this one is, is about um, how how often in comedy, I don't know if so much these days, but it used to be um, that you had the, the kind of lead figure and then you have the straight man, like Don Quixote at Sancho Panza. There was Abbott and Costello. In the case of the Marx Brothers, there were three of them. Um, but, but comedians sometimes play off of each other and um, and it, the straight man helps the comedian be the funny guy that he or she is. The title of the poem is Straight and Loopy True. You know what loopy means? Kind of, you know, dizzy, silly, mm -hmm. whatever. <clears throat> Straight and loopy true. You can't be off the wall without a wall. Any fool will tell you the straight man must be as brilliant as the star. Creating a reality, the star then deranges through his bizarre, the straight man inflates the balloon, the lead guy explodes it. Groucho needed Margaret Dumont's imperviousness to his outrageous insults to keep firing them off. Her obliviousness giving free rein to his wit. Lou Costello required Abbott's indifference to his peculiar predicaments to, pr to provoke is over-the-top tantrums. Quixote's enchantments, endearing and sad, seen through Sancho's loyal naivete. Hal only becomes king when Falstaff sacrifices enhance his better life, his better half. Your money or your life, the patented Jack Benny pause. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Who's the straight man here? And Edgar Bergen, outlasting them all, playing a straight man ventriloquist to the tuxedo-clad wooden dummy he birthed and bequeathed his brilliant, bratty humor. Yes, sir, Charlie McCarthy answered every interview question Edgar Bergen was ever asked. Perhaps we need to become our own straight man, leading ourselves to where the crooked lies showing us the only way we become free by understanding why it matters so to know who's on first. Who? Yes. To tune in to what is loopy true. There are probably some references there. They're, you know, <laughs> they're, 
you know, for, for, the, for an older generation. Have any of you ever seen um, the Abbott and Costello routine, Who's on First? Oh, he does. Go online and see it. Because the first baseman, his name is Who? And the second baseman, I think, is what? Why? And the third baseman is what? And the short. And so he says, Who's on first? And the guy says, Right. Who? He's right. <laughs> and they, can, they go on like that around the infield, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, okay, that's three poems. I, right. I, can, I can stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.